Okay, I think we're good. All right, everybody. I want to officially welcome you all to our mock law school class. These classes are a series of mock law school classes that we offer um, throughout uh, next year. So we'll be introducing to you um, each one of our first year professors are doing a mock law school class on the subject matter that they teach here at the law school, as well as some of our adjunct faculty members are going to be jumping on <clears throat> doing some mock law school classes. So next week, if you're interested on December 14th, uh, we have uh, Professor Conklin, who's doing a mock law school class uh, from 12 to 1 on search and seizures. So we hope for you to, to join that class. And uh, if you're interested in hanging on after the call, both my colleague and I, Francisco Rosas, will be available from 1 to 1.30 to answer any questions that you might have about the application. So uh, without any uh, further ado, I'd just like to welcome all of you. Professor Barreto is our director of our New American Legal Clinic. She is also um, a professor here teaching immigration law, and uh, she also teaches our um, first year law school class called Legal Methods. So we're really excited to have her on the call. She attended San Joaquin College of Law herself and uh, did her Juris Doctor here. And prior to that, she went to UC Merced and got her bachelor's degree at UC Merced. Prior to joining our full-time faculty at San Joaquin College of Law, she worked defending the rights of immigrant children as a staff attorney for the nonprofit organization Kids in Need of Defense, also known as KIND, and as an associate attorney for Lazaro Salazar's uh, law firm, where she remains of counsel, assisting with complex immigration cases. Mrs. Uh, Ms. Barreto, she is a li she's licensed in California and is admitted to uh, practice in the Executive Office for Immigration Review in all locations across the United States. And she's a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association, the American Bar Association, and the Fresno County Bar Association. She is fluent in both English and Spanish. So welcome, Professor Barreto. Thank you for um, leading this class for us today. Thank you, Diane. And thanks all for being here. I know everybody, it's a busy time of year with the holidays around the corner. So I appreciate your time. Um, by a show of hands, and it can be a Zoom hand, how many of you were able to either attend or watch the video recording of part one of this course? Okay, so I think the majority of you, um, for those of you who weren't able to attend, thanks for raising your hands. For those of you who weren't able to attend, I do recommend that you go back and watch it um, if you can and if you get some time because a lot of what we're going to cover in this section will make more sense to you if you already have the background of the first session. So normally we don't do these mock classes in two parts like this. Um, the reason we did this time is just there was a lot of information to cover and there seemed to be a lot of interest on part two of the course. Um, but these classes are meant to be just a, a sneak peek, a foundational kind of intro um, onto a very limited kind of area of that subject that we're covering. Um, so, uh, you know, just to kind of keep that in mind. Um, Next week, uh, Diane said that Professor Conklin, Judge Conklin, actually he's a judge here in Fresno County, um, will be running a criminal law search and seizure um, mock class and you will really enjoy that. He's a really great professor and actually he was my professor over 10 years ago. So he has a lot of experience and he's a really great asset to the college. And so if you can join us for that, I know that you will not be disappointed. But today we are going to talk about more immigration law. So for, a lot, for those of you who joined me last time, we were able to talk about where immigration law derives from, who are the major players in immigration law, and why it's important. And we started to brush up on citizenship. So as a reminder, citizenship is the end of an immigrant's journey. We want 
all immigrants, if they want to, to be U.S. citizens. And the reason for that, most importantly, is because U.S. citizens cannot be deported for any reason. And now nobody on this call, I'm sure, would advocate for committing crimes. But unfortunately, it happens. And even more unfortunately, even after you're sentenced and convicted, sometimes if you are an immigrant, you will have to serve yet another sentence and be deported for that crime. And even if you were in the United States as a young child, many times as infants, you know nothing about your home country, maybe you never returned to your home country, um, you will still be deported to that home country. And so it's sort of a double and very extreme punishment. And sometimes it is the matter of life or death because there are countries that will persecute and kill people um, on different bases of like race, religion, nationality, sexual orientation. Um, and so, you know, it can be double dangerous in that in that sense. Um, Diane or Francisco, I apologize, but I'm not able to share my screen. It tells me screen sharing is disabled and I'd like to do that if you can give me permission. Okay, meanwhile, that's being done. I um, started last course with saying, do you have any urgent burning question that needs to be addressed today? And the reason that I like to do that is because I want to make sure that you are getting out of this class what you hope to get, especially because you're here on a volunteer basis for no credit. And I understand that you're doing it because you're interested in law school, but I also love to share any knowledge that I can share. So if you have an urgent burning, I need to know this question, please let me know and I will make sure that we can address that. So I'll give you an opportunity to do that. If you have a question right now, please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask me the question. Otherwise, we'll just get started with the presentation and we can ask questions at the end as well or throughout. But um, if somebody was like, I came to this class just to ask this question, I would love to answer that for you. Okay, so it doesn't look like I have any questions. Are you able to see my screen now? I have a question. Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, Linda, uh, just in general, uh, my sister had her green card over 12 years and she's been in and out of the country. Uh, in the last five years, she's been about physically here about two years uh, and she's overseas now, she'd be back. Uh, there is a, a period over physically you need to be present in the last five years. And uh, there is confusion as far as uh, how many days per five years you need to be physically present before you really apply for naturalization. So I don't know offhand if you remember that number of days. Uh, some say yes, uh, it's so much or there is confusion in that period. Uh, of how many days you need to be physically present uh, before you apply? So there's actually, that's a two part question. Um, Mosen, is that how I say your name? Mosen? Mosen yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you for your question. So we did cover a little bit about that last um, course, but I'd love to clarify that for you. So to become a US citizen, there's two prongs that are relevant to your question. One of them is a physical presence requirement. And the other one is a continuous residence requirement. Mm -hmm. So the continuous residence, we will start there. In order to be found to have been continuously residing in the United States and eligible for citizenship, you must not have trips over six months in any occasion meaning that if your sister was gone out of the country for more than six months, she has to overcome a rebuttable presumption. And rebuttable presumption is something we'll hear throughout law school, not just in immigration law, but in all areas of law, there is the concept of rebuttable presumption. So a rebuttable presumption means that something is presumed, meaning I am assuming that it's true, but rebuttable 
means that you can present evidence to change my mind. I can rebut that conclusion. Mm -hmm. So say that your sister was gone for an eight month period of time. She can present evidence to say, I know that I was gone more than the six months that I was supposed to be gone, but I have evidence to show that I did not abandon my residency in the United States. Mm -hmm. And those types of documents can be things like tax records, mortgage statements, um, employment confirmation, proving that she was still continuously employed, especially in the age of remote employment. Um, so anything that can prove that, yes, even though I was gone a long time, my residence, my home was still in the United States. Now, if she was gone for more than one year in total in one trip, so one trip lasted more than one year, that presumption is no longer rebuttable. So even though you can say, well, my home was still in the US, I still have all of this evidence, you're no longer eligible. The presumption is just a matter of law. So if she has a trip that was over one year in length, she's going to have to wait until that five year period overlaps it or trespasses it so that she can now show that she's been in the United States. Now, the second part of your question is the physical presence requirement. So in addition to saying, I have no trips longer than six months and definitely no trips longer than one year, the second part of that question is the physical presence. How many days were you, was your body physically in the United States? Mm -hmm. So this is actually done by simple math and there's 365 days in a year at five years, because at five years is when she would be eligible to become a US citizen. So we know that that totals to 1,825 days. She has to be physically present, her body in the United States for at least half of those days. So we would divide that by two and we come to a figure of 912.5 days. So in order to make sure that she was physically present, she would have had to have been present in the United States for at least 913 days over the past five years. Mm -hmm. But that's also having to take into account, did she have any trips over six months or over one year? Mm -hmm. I see. That's okay. So um, it's not one or the other. A lot of times I've even seen seasoned immigration practitioners confuse this. They say, oh, I can do physical presence or continuous residence. No, it's both. They need to both show that they were in the United States more than half the time and not or, and that they had no trips over six months. If they did have a trip over six months in the last five years, they need to present evidence to rebut the presumption. If they had a trip over a year in the last six months, I'm sorry, in the last five years, then they can no longer rebut the presumption and therefore will have to wait until that clock resets. So in the last five years, the beginning of the last five years, if, if I go back, uh, she had a, a permit to stay more than a year. How does that work in the equation? It doesn't. It has uh, no I bearing see. on, yeah, it doesn't. It, do, it just says that, yes, we allowed you to stay longer, right. but you still I have see. to wait to apply. So we the need only to ex The only exception is for people who are in the military or some sort of ambassador or okay. diplomat because they are stationed on U.S. territory in Thank these you. foreign countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. So let's just quickly flash back through our PowerPoint. We talked about the different um, the different branches of government and how these big players, DHS and DOJ, fall into these branches of government and why that's important. And we talked about the different agencies that are involved in hearing and um, adjudicating immigration benefits and immigration cases. And we talked about the appeals process and about how cases can be um, heard in an appeals process and where they are heard if you are 
not in agreement with the decision from either a lower court or one of the agencies. So we talked about all of that last time. We also talked about the difference between a citizen and a resident. So Musen just told us that his sister is a resident and she's having issues with maybe applying for a citizenship because she doesn't meet the continuous and physical presence requirements possibly. I don't know, we need to look into that a little more, but these are here as part of the prongs that are required to apply for citizenship. And that's pretty much where we left off. Um, and we talked about how people who, you know, you will ignorantly see people who are writing on social media or blogs sometimes, and they'll say, well, why don't people just become citizens? Well, because I can't become a citizen unless I am what first? A resident. A resident. I can't even become a citizen until I'm a resident. And people often don't understand the difference between citizenship and residency, which is what we covered last session. Um, and people further don't understand that to become a resident, it's actually really hard. It's actually much harder than becoming a citizen because once you're a resident, there's always a pathway to citizenship. So once you are what we hear casually as a green card holder, there's always a way that you can have an opportunity to apply for citizenship if you so choose. But that's not the case with residency. There's not always a way to become a resident if you are living in the United States or even if you're living abroad and people say, oh, why don't they just come the right way? Because it's not easy to do so. And sometimes it's not even just a matter of it being easy. Other times it's just impossible. There is no way for me to come to the United States, even if I have family here. And so um, we are now going to move into the section of where we talk about how people can apply for residency. So the most popular is family-based immigration. So family-based immigration is where you have someone who can petition for you who is what's considered to be an immediate relative. So the immigration system has different classifications of relatives, but the most popular and in opinion of the immigration attorneys that I know, the best is what's called an immigrant um, category that's what's considered to be an immediate relative. So the immediate relative category is either your spouse, who's a US citizen, or your son or daughter, who's a US citizen and over age 21. And the reason that that's the best category to be in is because there is no waiting period. If you have a spouse or a son or daughter who's over age 21, they can petition for you without limitation. There is no limit on the number of visas that are awarded in that category, which is not true for other categories. The best way that somebody who is a non-resident who can become a resident is through a process called adjustment of status. Adjustment of status can be done in one of three popular ways, and there may be some other ways, but for purposes of today's basic foundational course, we're just gonna talk about these three most popular ways. One is if the person had a lawful entry. So that may look like I came to the United States from Argentina on a visitor visa. I came to visit my best friend who was getting married. And at her wedding, I fell in love at first sight. And I get married to the person that I fall in love with at first sight. And that person is a US citizen. And so now I'm in the immediate relative category. Because I entered the United States lawfully, and because I married a US citizen, I am now eligible to become a resident myself. So that is a process called adjustment of status, and it's completed here in the United States. 
the fees, these are just government fees that we're talking about, are um, approximately $3,000, and that's including a medical examination. Now, the fees have gone up over the years, and so you may know somebody who got their green card through a spouse many, many years ago and only paid $500. That may have been the case, but we're talking about fees as of today. You're going to look at around $3,000, and that's not including attorney's fees. So attorneys will charge their fee on top of that unless the person is fortunate enough to use the services of a clinic, such as the New American Legal Clinic, if they qualify, and therefore they don't have to pay attorney's fees. Okay, so that's the most basic way that we hear often people who enter the country legally can stay in the United States as a resident. The second one is if that person has a petition prior to April 30th, 2001. This in the law is called the INA, which is the Immigration and Nationality Act. The INA is where Congress has the statutory provisions of laws that pertain to immigration. So if you had a copy of the INA or you Google a copy of the INA, under INA section 245I, 245 and then the, the letter I, you will see a provision that allows people who have a approved or what they call approvable when filed petition prior to April 30th, 2001, they have an opportunity to also adjust their status within the United States, even if they entered legally, illegally. So this is different from the other scenario. In this scenario, I entered in 1996, but I entered illegally. I crossed the border illegally and I've just been here ever since. In 1997, my father, who was a resident at the time, petitioned for me. My dad started a family-based petition for me, but because the priority dates are so backlogged, and we'll take a look at what that looks like in just a moment, I was never able to adjust my status. Instead, I had a child here in the United States, so that child is a U.S. citizen based on the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And now that child is 21 years old or older. So because my dad applied for me prior to that date of April 30th, 2001, my child who is now 21 or older and is a U.S. citizen can revive that petition for me and I can complete my residency application here in the United States. And the government slaps me on the wrist and says, okay, because you did not enter legally, you have to pay a $1,000 fine. And I say, that's fine, no big deal, because I would rather pay the fine and be able to get my green card here in the United States, which is the easiest, quickest way. Okay, questions about lawful entry versus unlawful entry and the petition prior to April 30th, 2001. Any questions about that? Okay, so another tool that has been widely used in recent years is called parole in place. And parole in place is a benefit that's afforded to members of the US military who have are either veterans who have been honorably discharged or are currently serving. So again, let's go back to the scenario. I entered the United States unlawfully in the year 2000. I didn't have a petition prior to April 30th, 2001. My dad, I didn't have anybody who could have petitioned for me, but I lived in the United States unlawfully undocumented for all of these many years. It's now 2022. And I had a daughter in the year 2000 when I entered. She's a US citizen based on what amendment of the constitution? 14th. 
the 14th. The 14th Amendment. So she's a U.S. citizen and she is now in the U.S. Armed Forces. Because my daughter is in the U.S. Armed Forces, she can apply for parole in place, which acts like a legal entry for me. So even though I did not enter legally, because whether it be my son or daughter or my spouse is serving in the armed forces or was honorably discharged as a veteran, I get the benefit to pretend like I entered legally. And why would that be important based on what we've discussed? Because of the fine, it helps you not have to pay the fine. Well, I wouldn't be able to pay the fine anyway because I didn't have an, a petition prior to April 30th, 2001. But why do I want to show that I have a legal entry? Uh, like immediate family members. Immediate family members, and I can apply for what? Residency. Your residency. Adjustment of status. Now, we talked about petition prior to April 30th being found in INA 245I. Adjustment of status based on lawful entry, based on admission, is found on INA 245A as an apple. So again, if you had a copy of the laws of the INA 245A, you would see the provisions that apply for those who have a lawful entry. And you would also see the provision on 245I that applies to those who don't have a lawful entry, but they had a petition prior to April 30th, 2001 that they can now use to revive. And like um, Ms. Flynn said, would have to pay the $1,000 fine, but that's okay because it gives me an avenue to residency. So that's why parole in place is a very popular um, avenue for people who have members in the U.S. Armed Forces, family members in the U.S. Armed Forces, because they kind of find a loophole, I guess you could say. It's not a loophole because it's a provision in law, but it's a loophole because I didn't enter legally and I don't have a petition prior to April 30th, 2001, but because I have a family member, I have another way that I can apply. Does that make sense? I have a family member in the Armed Forces. Okay. Questions about adjustment of status in these three scenarios. Okay, in each of these three scenarios, you need a petitioner because remember, we're talking about family-based immigration and we talked about the immediate relative category and we talked about who that immediate relative can be that would benefit you. It has to be, must be son or daughter over age 21 or spouse who's a U.S. citizen, and your son or daughter also has to be a U.S. citizen over age 21. Yes, go ahead. Uh, on the lawful entry, let's say uh, you said if the father applied uh, for her, for the daughter and she came illegally, what happens during that period if the dad passed away? What happened to the petition? It drops to? If the person was in the United States at the time of death of the petitioner, they can request a conversion of the petition under back to the INA, write down all of these codes in law if you're interested in immigration law because you're gonna need them. You'll find it in INA section 204L, L as in Linda. So if you look up the INA at 204L, it tells you that normally, when somebody dies and they are the petitioner, the petition dies with them. But in certain scenarios, you can ask for relief under INA 204L, stating that while the petitioner has died, you're asking for a humanitarian reinstatement and for a substitute sponsor. You're going to ask for someone to take the place of the person who died. Who would and that be? And you may be able to um, revive the petition that way. So that would be, let's look at that really quickly. That would be someone who is um, also a US citizen or resident. And it's, you'll find it on 
the instructions of the form I-130. So the I-130 is the petition itself, but you will find who is eligible to be a substitute sponsor on the instructions. And I'm here looking at USCIS.gov, and this is um, important for you to look up if you are looking for documents um, related to, to immigration. All of these forms are free for download, and so you should never pay for these forms, and you can use them for research and also when you're completing um, documents for immigration. So if we look at, um, let's see here. If we look at the I-130, I want to see here, um, there is information, all kinds of instructions that tell you what you will need. And in the case of a substitute sponsor, you can also look it up, but it's actually quite um, generous when you need a substitute sponsor. It can usually be another parent, a spouse, a child over age 21, a grandchild, which is very rare. Um, so it has to be somebody who, right, who um, is a relative of the person. It can't be a friend or you know, business partner or something like that. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right. So I know that you're probably thinking the next thing you're thinking, okay, well, great, but I don't have um, a lawful entry. I don't have a petition that originated prior to April 30th, 2001. And I don't have an immediate family member who is in the armed forces. So what can I do? And this is what a lot of people, this situation that they're in, they have to do what's called consular process. Consular process is where the person has to either return to the embassy in their home country for completion of um, their application, or if they've never been to the United States and they're trying to come to the United States, they have to go through an interview process there. But if you entered the United States unlawfully, you're going to need a waiver. And a waiver is to waive your unlawful entry and unlawful presence into the United States. For purposes of this kind of waiver, you need what immigration law calls a qualifying relative. And a qualifying relative for purposes of this type of waiver specifically for entering and remaining in the United States, the only people who can qualify to assist you with this type of waiver that you need is your parent who is a US citizen or lawful permanent resident or your spouse who is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. So who did I not say qualifies? Like a child. Your child. So God forbid, even if your child is severely ill, dying from cancer, like I said, you know, an extreme situation, God forbid, immigration says too bad, so sad. They don't qualify to file for a waiver for you. And this is why a lot of people get stuck because they say, oh, yay, I have a son or daughter over age 21, but I didn't enter legally. And I don't have a petition prior to April 30th, 2001. And I don't have a son or daughter or spouse in the military. And then they say, but I was told that my son or daughter can help me adjust my status. Is that true or false? Why? Why is it false, Lorena? because they entered unlawfully they entered unlawfully so they need what the waiver they need a waiver and we said for a waiver to be granted you need to either have a spouse who's a u.s citizen or resident or the applicant's parents who's a u.s citizen or resident and in order for that waiver to be granted you have to show what immigration law calls extreme and unusual hardship. Mm -hmm. So you have to say that if I am not granted residency, my spouse or my parent who is a U.S. citizen or resident will suffer extreme hardship 
because they depend on me for reasons X, Y, or Z. It's not just like, oh, well, I have a spouse, so I qualify. No, the qualifying relationship is only part one. Part two is the extreme hardship. So what we often see is a couple, mom and dad, who are married, but they're both unlawfully present in the United States. They're undocumented. Now, mom and dad have a family and they have children over age 21 who are U.S. citizens who were born in the U.S. But because they entered unlawfully, because they have no petition prior to April 30th, 2001, and because they don't qualify for parole in place, they need a waiver. But mom and dad can't help each other because they're both unlawful, so they have no qualifying relative. Their only hope is if their parents are U.S. citizens or residents, and if they can show that their parents need them for maybe some sort of hardship reason. Do you understand that? Okay, so give me a little hello in the chat if that makes sense, please. I want to make sure everybody's still awake. Okay, you guys are ahead of the game because a lot of people in this world don't know this. If you did know this, please say, I already knew this in the chat. You know, Linda, I can't do that because I don't know where these things are, the hello and... and that okay, talking. that's okay. No, no so problem. I say hello. <laughs> okay, some people say I knew this. Now, here's the kicker. This April 1, 1997, I saw a couple of I knew this in the chat, which thumbs up for you. You are, you are doing good. So if you are one of the ones that said I knew this in the chat, can you tell me why April 1, 1997 is a key date? So there was a couple people there that said, I knew this. Can anybody tell me, or you can say, I knew this, but I don't know that. <laughs> going once, going twice. Anybody brave enough to tell me why April 1, 1997 is the key date in this equation? All right, well, I'm here to teach you, so let's keep teaching. April 1, 1997 is a key date because there was a change in immigration law that said that if people had multiple unlawful entries after April 1, 1997, they're not even eligible for a waiver. So even if they have that spouse or they have that parent who can show hardship, immigration law says too bad, so sad because you left after you were not supposed to leave because there was a change in the law. And so now we are going to slap you with what's called a permanent bar. And a permanent bar means there's no waiver available. The only remedy is to remain outside of the United States for 10 years. And they say, there's no waiver available for you. Even if your spouse is dying of cancer, like I said, I know that sounds very callous and terrible, but that's what immigration law says. And I want to be clear about that because people don't understand that. They don't understand that even if we have family members who are in the United States and dying, because I had multiple entries after April 1, 1997, unlawful entries, make that very clear, no waiver for you. Go ahead, Lorena. Um, I'm just wondering, so if they have the multiple entries and if they, for example, have already served those 10 years out of the country, would they then be eligible for the waiver? They don't need a waiver anymore because I'm gonna say, it, like I say in Spanish, do you speak Spanish, Lorena? Yes. Okay, es castigo o es perdón? In, in Spanish, waiver translates to perdón, mm -hmm. and castigo is punishment. 
So your punishment is 10 years. Right. But so if I can't forgive you and you did your punishment, then you don't need a forgiveness anymore. You served your time. Okay. That makes okay. sense. But if there's another reason, for example, you presented false documents mm-hmm. to a to an officer, that will always need a waiver because there's no amount of time that will say, okay, we forgive you for that now because it's been 100 years. Mm-hmm. They don't care. You will always need a waiver for certain inadmissibilities, but for the inadmissibility specifically related to unlawful entries after April 1, 1997, multiple unlawful entries, let me make that clear, multiple unlawful entries after April 197, then they can wait the 10 years out and no longer need a waiver. Okay, that makes sense. And that's very useful. Thank you. You're welcome. And to Edward's question in the chat, does that also apply to forced deportation? If you have an order of deportation, Edward, you're going to need two possible waivers. One, for unlawful presence, what we talked about, you were here illegally, assuming you only had one, one uh, unlawful entry. And two, another waiver, which is called the I-212, permission to reapply after deportation. So that's a separate thing. And you will always need an I-212 if you've been deported, no matter how many years have passed because you need permission to reapply after deportation. That's called an I-212 waiver. Okay, now Raquel, you had your hand up. Uh, Yes, but I think Edward (laughs) asked the question I was gonna ask. Oh, wonderful, thank you. So usually in these scenarios, people will say, Yeah, I just left the United States. I left the United States because my mom was sick in Mexico. So I just wanted to go back and see her. And now I've been out for 15 or 20 years. That person can reapply because they were not deported. They have no other immigration issues. They didn't present false documents. They didn't uh, lie to an immigration officer. So they're eligible to reapply, assuming that they have that petitioner who's a U.S. citizen spouse, or who else? Parent. I don't need my parent now because I don't need a waiver because I was out 10 or 15 years. Yep, Paul got it. Child over age 21. They still have to petition for me. They still have to ask for me to come. So I need a spouse over... Uh, a spouse or a child over age 21 who's a U.S. citizen. I don't need a waiver because I already, I already served my time. Okay, if you know everything I'm saying, tell me in the chat. I know everything you're saying. Did not learn anything new here. Okay, cool. This is why we go to law school, y'all. This is important. We learn things. All right, and I love, 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 love teaching this course because you become ambassadors and advocates so that when people say, oh, it's so easy, they could just do this, they could just do that. You're like, no, actually immigration laws are really stringent, really rigid, really difficult. And it's not that easy for people to just get their status, even if they're married to a US citizen, even if they um, entered legally, you know, it's very expensive. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have $3,000 just chilling, like to spend on paperwork. I'd rather much spend it on something else. Okay. So any questions up to this point? Okay. So next we're going to talk about Violence Against Women Act. So this is a provision in Congress that was authorized by the T- V P R A. I'm going to say that again. T V P R A. If you look up that law, T V P R A, you'll see that it's a um, law that Congress passed that includes all sorts of humanitarian relief for people who have been abused or trafficked or victims of crime. So I love VAWA because it 
is something that can benefit people who are in abusive relationships and may be afraid to report that abuse. So a lot of times, VAWA does not require a police report. It does not require for you to get law enforcement involved, which is why I love it. Even though VAWA is called Violence Against Women Act, it's not just for women. Um, sometimes you will hear the acronym VAMA, like M for men. Um, in order to be eligible for VAWA, you or your client, the applicant, must have a qualifying relationship, meaning that they have been abused by a US citizen or lawful permanent resident spouse, parent, or their son or daughter over age 21. So spouse doesn't require explaining. Parent is if I'm a minor, I'm 15 years old, and I'm being abused by my mom or my dad, who's a US citizen or lawful permanent resident, even though I'm a minor, I may qualify for VAWA. But my parent must be a citizen or a resident. Son or daughter is, I am 65 years old and I have a 25 year old son or daughter who's a US citizen who's abusive to me. The relationship must exist. You can't say, oh, well, um, this is like someone who's a father figure to me. It has to be a legally binding relationship. So for example, sometimes children are raised by their grandparents, but were never legally adopted. That would not qualify for VAWA because it's not their legal parent. Are you with me? Give me a thumbs up on screen if you're with me. Okay. It, for son or daughter, the son or daughter must be 21 or older and a US citizen or lawful permanent resident. And for spouse, you have to be legally married. You can't just say, oh, we're common law spouses. It's my longtime boyfriend or girlfriend. It has to be an actual legal marriage. VAWA abuse can be considered to be verbal, physical, or psychological. Police reports are not required and divorce is not required. So this means that if the abuse that you are suffering or your client is suffering is, for example, um, jealousy, extreme jealousy, tracking cars, tracking money, saying you can't eat that, I don't want you to get fat, or talking down, saying like you're a fat pig, you're this, you know, things that are not crimes. It's not a crime to call someone a fat pig, even though it feels like it should be, it's not. And it's not a crime to, for one person in a marriage to control all of the money, even though it feels like it should be, but it's not. And so if your client has gone through these things that would be considered emotional, psychological, physical, or verbal abuse, even though it's not a crime, it's still abusive. Does that make sense to everybody? Which is why police reports are not required. Divorce is also not required because some of you may be advocates who are versed in um, the cycle of abuse and knowing how hard it is to escape your abuser, especially if you have children together or if you rely on that person for financial security, and that person's controlling all of the money, that person won't allow you to work. It's really hard to leave an abusive relationship if you find yourself in those types of scenarios. So in the case of VAWA, even if the person entered illegally, back to the other screen, that will be forgiven because they've been the victim of abuse. So that may look like I entered illegally, in 1996, I don't have a petition prior to April 30th, 2001. I don't have a family member in the armed forces and I entered illegally. So normally I would have to do what? Consular process with a waiver. But I have proof that my spouse has been abusive to me. I can file VAWA without needing my spouse to petition for me or do a waiver for me, none of that, because I can prove that I've been the victim of abuse. 
Does that make sense to everybody? This process goes, uh, goes forward in the United States. So the person never has to return to their home country to do it, even if they entered illegally, so long as they can prove the abuse. Yes, Josh. I'm sorry, you're probably going to answer this, but um, if police reports and divorce and things like that are not required, what do they use to prove that they've been abused? So I've used all sorts of evidence. I've used text messages, Facebook messages, um, photos sometimes if there's you know photos of bruising and things like that. If okay. the abuser has been arrested for other things, for mm -hmm. example, um, DUIs, and I'm claiming that my husband was abusive to me when he's drunk, DUIs would show a pattern of alcoholism, right. possibly. I've used witness statements from friends or family members who have um, witness to the abuse. I've also used therapy records and I've yeah. tried to encourage my clients to go see a therapist if they can and use records like that. If okay. my client has had to, for example, stay overnight in a hotel because the abuse has gotten so bad that they left the home, I would use receipts of the hotel. Um, you always, always, always file a declaration and you try to be as detailed as possible in the declaration as well. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so another way that people can eventually get residency. So I want to, sorry, let me go back to VAWA really quick. Is if your VAWA is granted, you are granted lawful permanent residence. And why do we want lawful permanent residence? Because we can apply for what afterwards? Citizenship. Citizenship. So again, we want to know how can I eventually become a citizen? So another avenue that's available for people is what's called a U visa. Now, a U visa is when a person who has no status was the victim of, of a violent crime. They can also add in their qualifying members called derivatives, which would be their parents, children under 21, or siblings who are unmarried and under 18. This requires the investigative agency to confirm by signing a specific form stating that yes, this person was the victim of a violent crime and that form has a six month expiration date. The U visa process includes a built in waiver different from the waiver that we need from consular processing because it doesn't require hardship. Essentially, you say, because I was the victim of a violent crime, I should be granted a waiver for maybe multiple unlawful entries, um, for working in the US without status, please forgive me. And you say a balancing test. So you say, I was the victim of a very violent crime and I am a good person. I volunteer at my church. I always file my taxes. So you try to show why this person should be granted status as a U visa immigrant. Once the U visa is granted, they get status to remain in the US and work legally for a period of four years. And after the third year of that four years, they can apply for residency. They can apply for their green card. So U visa in itself is not residency, but it gives a pathway to residency and eventually citizenship. The reason U visa was created is because not everybody qualifies for VAWA. Maybe you were the victim of a crime or abuse, but maybe it wasn't by your spouse, parent, or son or daughter. Maybe you were um, you know, assaulted at gunpoint at the mall. Maybe you were the victim of sexual assault by a coworker. I mean, there's so many reasons why you may be eligible for a U visa, but it has to be that you were the victim of a crime to your person. You can't say, oh, someone broke into my house and stole all of my things, but I wasn't home. Because we don't know if that was a, a crime against you or that's more of like a property crime. Does that make sense? U visas are really cool, but Congress has only authorized 10,000 of them per year. And um, there are currently more than 200,000 people in waiting which means that the backlog for U visas are 12 plus years. 
So while it's a good option for people who have no other options, it's still a really long wait. Um, but my mom would say in Spanish, pues el tiempo va a pasar. Like, the time is going to pass whether you apply for U visa or anyway, or you don't. So you might as well apply, right? Edward, you have a question. Can you hear me, Edward? Your hand is raised. I don't know if you have a question you'd like to unmute. Um, yes. <clears throat> and that, that can be for uh, any violent crime. Um, a violent crime, there are qualifying crimes, but most crimes that are violent crimes towards the person will be eligible. Gotcha. Thank you. I, I got a question, Linda. Sure. So, you know, we said gunpoint, robbery at gunpoint or anything like that, even right, violent crime directed towards you. So what if there's like, the, for example, uh, the militias, right, that they kind of form themselves and they go at the border? Do they now, they're U.S. citizens and they hold, right, somebody crossing the border at gunpoint, right? Um, wouldn't that be considered uh, a crime there? Um, yes, but remember, you have to report this crime. So the crime must be reported and the investigative agency. If you're at the border, maybe it's going to be the FBI. Maybe it's going to be San Diego Police Department, assuming you're at the Southern California border, right? right. Um, so you have to make sure you report that and that they verify that, yes, you were, in fact, a victim. And then they would be eligible. Yes. But wow. in that specific case, Francisco, I would probably argue even T visa, the victim of human trafficking, for reasons wow. I can't get into today because we are out of time. We're actually at 1257. I can't believe I have part three of this class, you guys. I normally would get through this in one scenario, but we are going very detailed into here. Um, I'm on slide nine of 14, which means that I would still have some other things I'd like to cover with you. But instead of inviting you back for part three, I just invite you to apply to SJCL because I would love to have you in my class and have a full semester of this with you because I know these are issues that are surrounding our country and our communities and um, the more advocates we have, the better. So I'd love to take a moment to answer questions about anything that we covered either in class one or class two. Um, but I know Francisco and Diane are also available if you have general questions about admissions um, that you would like to discuss. So I'll leave some time for questions that we can cover, um, but there is still more that I'd like to talk about as far as asylum and removal defense and other types of things that we work on here at SJCL within our clinic. Um, like last time, if you learned something, say Merry Christmas in the chat. If you learned something today, say Merry Christmas in the chat or Happy Holidays if you don't celebrate Christmas. Professor Barreto, I wonder just for fun if you might buzz through the remaining slides just visually so we could just see all the stuff we could learn if we become a law school student. Sure, yeah, I'll kind of flip through them. So this is about asylum and how people qualify for asylum and exceptions and um, different requirements. And then removal defense, which is for people who are already in deportation proceedings, we can talk about how we can help them. More on removal defense too. And I know I'm going through these quickly, but as you see, I talk a lot more than what the slides say because there's no way I can fit all of this information on the slides. And this is actually my favorite slide, which is the know your rights slide, because even when we we have done a full consultation and we're like, you know, you don't tick off any of the boxes, you're not eligible for adjustment of status, not eligible for U visa, not eligible for T visa, not eligible for parole in place. Like we go through every single thing that we could possibly use to help the person. At a minimum, what we can do is know your rights information so that people know what to do if they come into a situation where they encounter police or ICE and how they can protect themselves. Um, so yeah, I would have loved to go through this with you, but we just don't have time today. Wow, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I love to see everybody again. I know I, I saw a lot of you class one. So thanks for coming back for class two. And if you have questions um, about immigration right now, we can still talk to them to talk about them. <laughs> I 
Uh, oh, so wow. I know I have a quick question. Sure. So in SJCL alumni, and I know obviously accreditation is within California, but you are also accredited to be able to work nationally within immigration, right? I think that's what I understood. Right. So if you decide, even if you are barred in California, but you decide that you want to practice, um, whether it be tax law or immigration law, you can practice in all 50 states because these are federal laws. So they don't require you to be admitted to a specific state bar. You just have to be admitted to a state bar. So I'm admitted to California state bar, but I could move to Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, and still practice immigration law without having to take the bar for that state. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. So unless there are any more questions directly for Professor Barreto, I wanted to invite you before you leave, Professor Barreto, maybe to share something that stands out to you about your own journey in law school. What was something that was that you was favorite about law school when you were here? So last time I shared that I liked that, you know, we were in a small environment and I knew all of my professors. Um, personally and, and felt like I could approach them. I think um, something else that I really enjoyed now, even now, is my alumni community. So I'm going to give you an example is I needed a letter of no charges filed from the district attorney for a client who has an interview in Ciudad Juarez. She's doing consular process with a waiver. So what we talked about, she completed that process and now she's at her final stage where she is going to um, go to her embassy appointment. Now, she had an old incident where she was not charged, which is why I needed the letter of no charges filed, but I contacted the DA's office and said, can I get this letter? My client's leaving and um, I need it ASAP, please, please, please. And they were like, no, sorry, no promises. It takes two weeks to get it. So I was like, darn. So I emailed one of my old classmates and I said like hey I know you're a DA I hate to put you in this position but please can you help me I'm desperate my client's leaving I know I should have asked for it sooner but it didn't come up until just now and she's like yeah sure no problem here it is so I was like oh my gosh thank you and I love that about this community she's an SJCL grad I'm an SJCL grad we don't work together at all but you have friends everywhere and that's incredible Nice. Thank you. That's a great story. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all again for being here. I know, I know your time is, I always say time is your most valuable resource because it's the one thing we cannot get back. You can even get your health back. You know, you may be unhealthy and kind of doing, eating too much fast food or junk, but you can get that back. You can't get time back. So the fact that you're here with me today, I really appreciate that. So have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Diane and Francisco, for having me again. Wow, thank, thank you. Thank you, Linda. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're here on the call. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. Um, let's see. Stop recording. Are you sure you want to? Yep. <laughs>